Our reading tonight is from the very beginning of the Gospel of Mark. In the, be the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, see, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, set his paths straight. So John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And the whole Judean region and the, all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the strap of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Friends, will you pray with me? Holy One, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So one of the things that they teach you when they teach you how to preach is that you aren't supposed to preach about things you are too close to. The idea behind it, which I think is a good idea, is that if you're too worked up about it, you might get too excited and it might get in the way of hearing what the Spirit has to say to a congregation. A preacher might just end up talking about themselves and miss the whole point. So I, I need to ask for pre-forgiveness. <laughs> Because I am and have been and will be amped up about John the Baptist. And it's difficult for me to put down how great I think he is. And that is going to shape the sermon you're about to hear. I love John the Baptist. I came into faith in a context that really prioritized the sinlessness of Jesus. And while I understood that I could never be Jesus... I thought that I could, maybe, be a lovable weirdo who wore strange clothes and had questionable hygiene and lived a life that pointed at God. It sounded like something that like, maybe I and all of us could, could do. I love John the Baptist because he is a way maker. As part of our Advent journey, we are in a series on waymakers on people who, like John, made paths straight and prepared a way for the Lord. Last week, Ashley preached on those who are blessed for the ways that they love. Next week, John will lead us through the Magnificat, Mary's song of praise. But tonight, we get John, way-making in the wilderness and baptizing on the shores of the Jordan River. Now, I love a way maker. I love a person who goes from impossible to improbable to done. And even more, I love a way maker who brings their people with them. Rudyard Kipling might remind us that he travels fastest who travels alone. But what's the good of getting there first if there's no one to celebrate with? No, the best way makers of the ones I've seen do three things. They know the rules enough to know how to break them. They play at the pace of their people. And they hold the ways they make open to the full impacts of their way making. They know the rules enough to know how to break them. Like any good bureaucracy whisperer, John knows the ways of his people. He knows about the mikvah, the baths used for ritual cleansing in the Jewish tradition. And he knows how people have to be ritually clean to serve as priests in the temple. 
They have to be ritually clean to have an encounter with God. John knows baptism is a crucial part of Jewish rites of conversion, that it's a sign of bringing someone into the covenant given to Abraham. And John knows about the temple system of sacrifice established for the forgiveness of sins, repentance, and to restore relationships between humans and God. The baptism John offers pulls on many threads of faithful Jewish practice, combining ritual baths, extended covenants, and the longing for forgiveness and restored relationships to form a new way to be in communion with God and with one another. John is operating outside of the locus of power here. He's in the wilderness, not the temple. And I think it's reasonable to wonder if, as Jesus will be later in the Gospel of Mark, John, too, is concerned with how the temple's working in Jerusalem. Later in this Gospel, Jesus will enter the temple and overturn the tables of those who are cheating and exploiting people, seeking ritual purity, forgiveness of sins, and restored relationships between humans and God. John stands outside that system, using the tools he has and the rules he knows to make a way accessible to all, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, offered freely on the shores of the Jordan River. He makes a way. John plays at the pace of his people. At the beginning of this sermon, I said it's no good getting there first if you get there alone. When you want to make a way, you need the people you're making a way with and for with you. What I mean when I say this is that John's way making could not go beyond what his people could imagine. There is this concept called the adjacent possible. It's the idea that says that people can't imagine further down the road than one exit farther than they've already gone. That you can't, go st- you can't imagine straight from a bicycle to a car. You need a motorcycle in between to bridge the gap. John, we can imagine, knew what his cousin Jesus was about and knew that people couldn't go straight from the metaphorical first century Aramaic equivalent of a bicycle to the metaphorical first century equivalent, Aramaic equivalent of a car. So he bridged the gap. He stood between what Judaism had been and what Jesus was ushering in and brought people with him, taking some of what they had been and some of what was to come and holding both together in a way people could wrap their heads around. He made a way. And then he holds the way he's making, he's made, open to the full impacts of his way making. It's likely that John knew there was a need for things to change. You don't go and live in the desert on locusts and honey because you think all is well where you are. The way John was making kicked the door open a little wider for people to be in relationship with each other and with God. The way John was making expected that things were going to change. You don't prepare the way of the Lord unless you think the Lord is coming. But we don't see a lot of ego from the guy proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. He doesn't seem possessive over his work, even though it would be very reasonable if he were. The person who builds a thing tends to feel it's theirs to shape. But that's not what we see from John. We see John generous, humble, looking forward to one who will come after him and be greater than he is. One who will baptize not with water, but with the Holy Spirit. And that's good. Because being graspy about a way is one of the things that can unmake it. 
When I worked in open government, my manager used to say that the way we could tell we had succeeded was when we noticed that the folks who used to disagree with us had become advocates for open with no memory that they'd ever disagreed. I still remember the day a director who fought us tooth and nail to put records online came by to complain about some other people who didn't know how important it was to put records online. And as tempting as it was, the thing to do in that moment was not to say, Matilda, the thing you're describing is open government, and you were wrong before, but now, now you figured it out and you're right. We should put records online. The thing to say was, Matilda, you are absolutely right. That is what we should do. Because a way gets wider when more people walk on it. A way gets better, more clear, more passable when more people travel along it, making it part of their journey and shaping it in turn. Good way makers welcome companions along the way who bring their ways of meaning making and make the way wider, more expansive, and more meaningful. John likely could not have anticipated all that would grow out of the baptizing he was doing on the shores of the Jordan. When he started, he probably did not imagine the spirit of the Lord descending like a dove or the ways we practice baptism today. But he was a wonderful way maker. He knew the rules, he loved his people, and he held his work with generous hands. He did his part. He made the way as wide as he could, and then he turned the way-making over to Jesus, who made a way wide enough for all of us. Amen.